me share. Oh, I have to give you access to share, right? Yes, please. All right, hold on. You should have access now. Yeah. Perfect, guys. Here we are. So you guys can see my screen. We're looking at what it says, the coaching lobby. I know I have a better view than this. Um, anyway, so um, here we are. And just want to talk to you tonight. It's about completing the sales contract. Um, I always like to start off the class with something good. If anybody wants to share anything good, um, if you don't mind, you know, taking 20 seconds, not elaborate, just, you know, we want to give you a little quick cheers. Something good going on? Sure. What do you got? I got a listing coming up, so I'm very, very thankful and grateful for it. I'm very excited. Oh, that's and, fantastic. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. A lot of lessons being learned. So thank you. I'm so excited for you. That's great. So happy. You see, you persisted, you were consistent, you kept going and going and never got discouraged. That I'm so happy for you. I knew thank it. you so much. Thank you so much. Is Mansi, is this the one you're doing your broker <laughs> open for tomorrow? Or is this is yeah. Yeah, yeah, tomorrow and then the open house Sunday. Yes. Yes. And I have a client that I'm bringing on Saturday. Yeah, and we had a little bit of a uh, mishap with the showing time appointment. It all worked out, didn't it? <laughs> Thank you for your patience. To teamwork. Thank you so um, much. We can't sweat the little stuff. Nope, I think it's great. And Dorothy, you just put something on, so that's fantastic. Yes, uh, my second listing. Yep, yeah, I'm so excited for you. Thank you. And everybody else will be doing that as well. So right now we're going to talk about the sales contracts. So um, we're going to go right through this. And oh, here we're going to go. We're going to play games. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I want you to know that, you know, one of the priorities of doing any kind of contracts, whether it be for listings or for buyers, OK, it's talking about getting your paperwork and getting everything in compliance. So I want you guys to really think about how you can systematize your systems. So as you start doing business, really try to put it into a systematic way. Um, beginner and advanced DocuSign classes are held at the office. Try to see when you can attend those. Please look at all the calendars of um, each market center and go to the classes that you need for your specific needs, okay? Sometimes you might find a rental class down in Rutherford compared to uh, Ridgewood or Fort Lee or Tenafly. Go where the classes and uh, Woodcliffe Lake, go wherever you find that class that is missing from your um toolbox and attend it there. So um, what I want you to get in the habit of your systematic way of doing things, what you're going to do is as soon as you get some type of client, I really would like you to start thinking about creating an opportunity for them by putting their contact information right away into command. It's an easy system to do. And then the way that you put them in, you know, think about it. A lot of times people have to be nurtured. So we really need to have patience with them. But if you're going to put in for a buyer, um, you know, you're going to click on the fact that it's a buyer lead. If you're going to be doing a listing, it's a seller lead. But you're able to attract, keep track of what you want to do and how you want to do it throughout. Okay, so put your buyer in the set of go for it, Kath. Sure, sure. So um, 
as you can see here, this is, I actually had put myself in the system. So you're seeing a screenshot for that and, you know, putting a buyer in. Uh, on the whole, who's using command right now? Who's already starting to use opportunities? Nancy, hands raised, Elizabeth, good. Okay, so we want to, the next time we're together, we want to see everybody's hands raised. Uh, it's a really good practice. The more you do up front and you start putting the information in, it is going to benefit you so greatly as far as being able to build that client and track that client and ultimately get paid and be able to work with them very seamlessly. One of the things that I saw the other day, I was watching a video from Amanda DeMarco, who's from our Rutherford office. And you know how in command you have, you're going to cultivate a client, you're going to go on appointments with a client, you're going to be actively working with a client. Well, under cultivate, the way she set up command was that underneath that cultivate, she actually had leads in there based on months. <laughs> So people that I'm going to work in for three months, people that I'm going to work, they're ready to work with me in six to nine months, people that are ready to work with me from nine to 12 months or even greater. That way she was prioritizing who needs my immediate attention versus who is somebody I'm going to continue to nurture. And I actually thought that was a great way to think about it. So we know for those of you that are there and for those of you that are not there, you're going to you know, set up that contact, get as much information in there then you're setting up the opportunity. What does the opportunity do for us? What is it, what does an opportunity represent? When we put in an opportunity in, what type of information are you putting in there? Go ahead, Nancy. I'm putting in either if it's the buy or the list side, I'm putting the contact information, the price, the commission, um, that kind of information. And you're putting in, so price, I think I heard you said price, so what their budget yeah. is. So you're understanding what their budget is. Now, all of a sudden, you're starting to build the numbers up in terms of the potential of the inventory that you can be selling this year. How many people, you're letting command start to build up how many people you're gonna help this year and the type of a volume of inventory. And it's a ballpark in the beginning. They may tell you it's 500,000, that's a ballpark. You may end up with a house for 400,000, or you may end up with a house at 700,000, but it's a ballpark and it's directional. But it's again, giving you information that's gonna help you track your business. And then of course, as we go through command, once we have that opportunity, we showed them a house, we're ready, we move forward in terms of the document. So, and then we go through offers and commissions. So this one-stop shopping in command <laughs> really helped us simplify how we look at our business and how we manage our business. So uh, let's move forward, Arlene. Okay, perfect. So um, the one thing I just wanted to, Kathy, you had said what Amanda does. So when they're in Cultivate, there was one of the stages that you said she does? Well, what she did, which I thought was, I, I liked the way she did it with buyers under Cultivate, is she basically had uh, it was people that would be zero to three months, let's say. And I'm using that as an example. So right. that idea of people that are ready to buy, they're ready, willing to able, and they want me to go out on appointments with them. So it's like that, think about that three month window, right? Yeah. Then I've got people that might be in the four to six month range. Okay. okay. And that are people that they're, they want to start understanding what's out there in the market, they may not be ready to go on appointments because of when they need to close, right? They're close, they, maybe they have a lease that's up or maybe they have to sell something else. Um, so now I have people that I can put in that bucket that I met. Then I have the people that they said to me, I'd like to buy this year, but they don't really have any specificity. They're not pre-approved yet. So I may put them in like a nine to 12 month bucket. And again, this is just an example. But I actually thought that for me, I thought, you know, that's a great way to look at it when you're thinking about cultivating people because it's helping me prioritize my time and be most productive with them. So that who are the right. people I need to spend a lot of time with and who are the people that I'm going to put on smart plans, right? And nurture, I'm going to stay in contact with them, but I don't have to give them 100% of my time. And it's funny because I was going to ask you about that because I know for myself, I have multiple tags for any buyers or sellers that I put into command. So any of my contacts, 
I will put similar time slots for how long it's going to take that mm -hmm. they say they're ready. And whatever they, if they tell me three months, I'm calling them in a month. Right. If they tell me four months, I'm calling them much before that because mm -hmm. I'll find some excuse to be able to talk to them. Um, Sanoon, you have a question? Yes. So I have a question. It's like a, when you were showing it that how we put the buyer information, that how much they can afford it. Do we need to put it like, a, do we need to see that their pre-qualifier, uh, like a bank statement, how much they, they qualify? So everybody can run their business the way they would like to. The standard that I have put in place for myself to run my business prior to me taking anyone out and showing any properties, mm -hmm. I request a copy of their pre-approval. Okay. So therefore that means I get that piece of paper in hand. Now, if that piece of paper is in my hand and they're not looking to, to buy for five months or four or five months, I know when we really start looking and we're, you know, we're going out, mm -hmm. if I go to put an offer in, that pre-approval might have to be updated. With the slightest change of an interest rate, it does change the purchase power a buyer might have. So we always have to be cognitive to look out for making sure we have updated pre-approvals. So that's always a good thing, but I prefer to vet my people and make sure that I'm not wasting my time. Um, and I give them, you know, mortgage people that I know and trust and then know and understand that it's a true valid pre-approval. And I ask if they submit their documents, meaning did they put in paperwork or was it just verbally told to them how much money they make and a credit check was not done. Things okay. come up and people don't realize that they're on their credit reports when they're run. So I always like that done in the beginning and most of the mortgage um, lenders that I deal with will always do that to give a qualified pre-approval. Thank so, you. No problem. Okay. Um, you know, I want you to also think about um, how you're in the people section, you're entering in all the names and information for each person that's gonna be involved in the transaction. Um, when you're in the beginning, all you're doing is entering them at as a name, like Kathy was saying, whatever their price point might be, their address, their um, contact information, how you can reach them. If they have a spouse, I like to get birthdays. I like to get as much information as I can and put that in. So when I do have conversations with them, I can talk to them about it. When you're thinking command and tags also, which is a way to sort your things, Think about birthdays. And if you're going to put birthdays in, you might want to just put um, something that you can recognize the month on it as well. Um, everyone that when you're going to go in and now use a transaction and you're going to do some type of documents with them, you're going to be doing it through DocuSign. And there are very different templates that are out there. So if you put in that it's a buyer, your buyer, um, you click the button that says checklist and then those auto populate in there. So you really wanna make sure that you have all the information that you can filling it out. Um, what we have to do over here for you just to write an offer up. This is a buyer that you're working with and you're gonna write an offer up for them. Now, the way that we broken this down, Kathy has these three that she clumped up here. Um, it confuses me every time. <laughs> but what this is, is the exclusive buyer agency, agency agreement, the consumer information statement, and the dual agency form. Now this dual agency form, you need to sign that on any offer that you're submitting on any property, no matter what 
company that um, the listing side is. So anytime you put in anything with a buyer, you have to put down that you could be a dual agent if the opportunity arises, okay? Then we go into what's really specific for each property would be to write this offer. And I get them all done at the same time is the New Jersey contract of sale. It's the affiliate business affiliated form. It's the lead paint if the house was built in 1978 or earlier, older. Um, if it was the seller's disclosure, the buyers have to initial it and sign, initial each page and sign it. Now the owner confirmation or receipt of an offer, that is something optional. I choose not to use it right in the beginning, but that doesn't mean that you don't have to. You can use it if you would like, right at the beginning when you're first submitting an offer. I find that if I do not get cooperation from the list side, I will then submit my offer again and put it in at that point. And I will highlight it to the, the listing agent. This is another offer I want to make sure that the sellers have seen it. And I also will do that if it's the highest and best. Um, there's a transaction contact sheet that I personally use all the time. I find it very easy for me. I actually like to have a full report and the contact sheet um, printed out from my own little, like I used to be able to do it on one piece of paper. So I'd have that on the front and the back. And I could always keep it in, you know, however many deals I had, just so I could keep track of who's on what deal. And it's a system that if I have 10 deals going at once, I don't have to think about which attorney is with it because I have that contact sheet. Um, permission to advertise. That means if you don't get that signed, you cannot advertise on social media or anything. <clears throat> unless you have that signed. Uh, the wire fraud notice, it's, you know, unfortunately a real common thing that people are having issues with right wire frauds. And then the home warranty, you know, once an offer is accepted, this is an optional form as well. If, you know, but I do always recommend that if you're offering it to one person, you have to make sure you offer it to everybody. So always get in the habit of offering it, but they don't have to accept it and they don't have to sign for it. Can you do this one, Kath? Sure, sure. And I'm gonna just add something from the prior screen. One of the things that I do when I submit an offer and I put in my file, and I believe Arlene, you may do the same thing, um, and that is, um, I make sure that I have a copy of the MLS fact sheet, including a uh, brief tax. And I give that so that there's a complete file. I want that listing agent to know that I am ready to, uh, and my buyer is ready to move forward um, on it. So hold on one second because um, we need to get to the next page. And I don't know if I have access to move forward. No, I, I just had a question, sorry. sorry, about the home warranty. Sure. I didn't no I didn't understand what that form is. Like, what is that home warranty form for? It's a form that just says that you offered it to them. If they would like to take it or not, it doesn't really matter. Right, uh, so but this, can't. go ahead, Nancy. Sorry, I didn't, I like, why, why would you offer that to the buyer? Um, this is a protection that if certain items come up in a home inspection, mm -hmm. then you might want to, if the seller wants to do it or the buyer wants to do it, they offer what's called the home warranty. A seller can do it and it would cover the life or the time frame that the house is listed and one okay. year from date of close for the buyer. Got it. Um, so you need to then to you, do it. Okay. So it would so cover you, him for, you know, cover that buyer from the day of closing one year out. 
Okay, so then you have to, do you have to make sure that, like, do you have to give buyer options of which home warranty company they should sign up for or like, um, you can so that they're protected? You can recommend three. Um, at one point, there was a program that we were using, an ex, you know, an exclusive one within the um, Keller Williams, but I don't believe that's, we can check into that. If that's an exclusive okay. one that we give out, we're not required to, um, re, you know, required to ask them if they want it or not anymore. So, and then if the seller provides home warranty, which in this market it's not happening, but let's say if the seller provides home warranty, then we have to still tell the buyer to submit this form to, because the seller is providing it. Yes, the sellers would have submitted it, but then the buyer has to call. They get the number from the seller. And some sellers do take it, even in today's market, because what happens is it covers them if something fails within the house, you know, while it's being listed. So it's like Got an it. insurance policy for them. Got it. If you have a seller that's offering it, like I had, I was representing a buyer, a seller was offering it. I got from the listing agent what was included in the warranty that they were offering. And they were allowing up to, at the time, maybe it was $600, but there's different levels of home warranty. So it was a conversation with the listing agent that um, the buyer could then determine if they were comfortable with that level of warranty or they wanted something different. Okay. Um, so it becomes a conversation. And then also once the year is up, if a buyer does have a home warranty, once the, so in, that, in my example, it was on the seller's dime. Once the year is up, the buyer then has an option to continue with that warranty program or Got not. It. Okay. So, you know, some of this becomes fancy conversations between agents um, okay. depending upon the house on it. Okay. So, and one thing too, there are various um, there are various levels, like Kathy said, but different companies offer different things. So there's a replacement. You know, they try to fix it. If they can't fix it, they replace it. But that all is fine. You know, print. So you always have to make sure you know what you know. The buyer has to know what he's looking at. Right. Right. Um, I give the information to the buyer, but it's up. It's their due diligence. There's only so much due diligence we can do. We're not buying the house. They're buying the house. So we provide the information. We give them the contact information. We share with them whatever we've been provided with the listing agent. And then we encourage them to make that, have that communication. So they have an educated decision on their own, not based on our opinion or us being a third party. Arlene, we're missing the slide that we had earlier with the funnel. I think we have to go back. Yeah, there we go. Sorry, did I slide it? That's okay. That's all right. Oh, we also have a question. Naomi, you have a, a question. No, not a question, but I guess an observation because I know that in the office, they have the literature for America's Preferred Home right. Warranty as one of the approved vendors. Is that still the case? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. and... I would think each, Always good each one of our members drop in area. Go ahead, Kath. Sorry. No, that's okay. That's okay. All I was saying was that I believe that you would probably find that warranty program in each of the market centers. Right. Um, that was so funny because we're on the same page. I was thinking the same thing that you can always look in your area that they have different vendor information in your offices. So check back in the market centers for that. So, you know, the, the purpose of this slide and this conversation here is, you know, with the recipe for a strong offer, it's one thing to fill out the, co the contract. It's another thing to actually have a conversation with your buyer as to how, what type of offer you want to put in and how you want to come across, how strong you want to come across. So the intention here is Number one, we always recommend, you know, when you think about it, when we look at an offer, what's, what are the components? And we have here in the funnel, the offer price, the closing date, could be also uh, terms like the, the inspection. Um, 
and the deposit. So you have those things. And then what are the additional levers? So you want to talk to a listing agent because you want to find out and you want to gain insight on what the selling is looking for. So you can guide your buyer to make the best decision on the offer they would like to submit. And especially in this environment with multiple offers, we want everyone, I mean, all the time we want our buyers to have best foot forward. And you as an agent, this is where your art of having conversation and 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 finding out information that can help your buyer make decisions is really critical. So besides coming up with and helping them with, with you know, giving them some indication of what's happening with the market and the type of range of price they could offer, it should always be their decision of that number that they offer, but you're giving them based on the facts of what's happening in the area so that they can be educated on it and how things are coming in price-wise from a list to sale price ratio. How much deposit are they able to put down? And then how that deposit will get split a rid, you know, at the beginning, once the offer is accepted and what cash they're bringing to close. Those are conversations to be had. Closing date, those are conversations you wanna understand from the listing side, what's the seller looking for? You're always representing the buyer. It's your fiduciary responsibility to represent them. You're gaining information to have a conversation. So the buyer can say, you know what, that works for me or it doesn't work for me. I have flexibility, I don't have flexibility. So that's where you, you're starting to develop the information you need to present the offer and also to have further conversation with the listing agents. In addition to those three components, there are things that can make the offer stand out. Uh, inspection, we've been talking about a lot about that this past year. You know, traditionally there is a home inspection. What we, in many cases, what we do is we focus the home inspection. The home inspection is still done, in, is done completely. But in terms of saying that you're going to make this, you're not gonna nickel and bind them. This is not the time for someone to get a new kitchen. This is not the time to get a new floor. This is about structural issues, mechanical issues, environmental issues. And that is how sometimes we position our offers to say that the issues that will be uh, asked to be considered for resolution would be mechanical, environmental, and structural. Um, appraisal. Uh, you want to understand up front if your um, buyer is wanting to give a lot of money, you know, really go over asking. You have to have that conversation with them to say, well, what happens if the house doesn't appraise? Do you have money to make up the difference? You can't guarantee that the seller is going to just automatically say, well, okay, you don't, we don't have to come up with a number. So, you know, most of the time people will meet in the middle. But if you have a house that let's say, let's say the house is $450,000 as a list price, and your buyer decides they want to offer. 500,000. That's a $50,000 difference. So what happens if the house actually appraises at $475,000? Well, they're going to get their mortgage on $475,000, right? Not on the 500. So they've got to then, we have to look at, there's a $25,000 gap. How is that buyer? Are they prepared to actually, if the seller said to them, I'm not going to renegotiate a price, are they prepared? Do they have $25,000 in cash? These are the conversations you wanna understand up front to position yourself because then that will impact the type of offer they put in and also for them to be prepared. Um, because you don't want it to be that you come to the end almost to closing and you are, oh, it went very small, Arlene. Can you put it back a slideshow? Thank you. <laughs> it's got a life of its own. Um, so appraisal, you don't wanna wait until we come to the appraisal period to find out that the buyer can't perform because the house is, the house is appraised, ends up coming in less than what their mortgage is. You wanna have those conversations up front. So that is also a way to leverage um, and understand what it is because sometimes like for example, there's something called an appraisal um, floor or ceiling. I don't know what the right word is, but in any event, so for example, uh, if there's an appraisal gap in those examples that I had, 
you know, paying, offering 500,000 comes at 475. I've had my buyers that were willing to, to uh, waive up to $10,000. So as an example, so they were willing, they had $10,000 in cash that they could have access to if the house didn't appraise anything lower then they couldn't, they weren't going to be able to do that. So there's different strategies that um, can be talked about to be able to handle appraisals based on the competitive market and what's right for your buyers. Um, financing, the right realtor and the right lender are going to both reach out to the listing agent to communicate confidence behind client and closing. So it's like, what is that conversation? Is, that buy, is your buyer's lender willing to talk to the listing agent? I've also had lenders actually write a letter. It's not a love letter. It's a letter from the lender saying that this person, I personally looked at this file and they financially qualified. They are good for this loan. So it's a financial letter. Um, escalation clause. An escalation clause, not used a lot. Um, most recently it has been used. This is the idea here where let's say the, what, what the buyer is saying is that if all the offers come in and let's say they come in at 500,000, that buyer is saying they will pay an additional, let's say $5,000 on top of the highest offer that came in. Those are something that have to be really talked through to really understand it. It's almost like an automatic bid, but it also has to make sure that they really understand that they could end up at, end up pay, like getting what they wished for, meaning that they're paying all that money or they prepared to pay all that money on it. And they have to make sure that they're, that the listing side, the seller is even interested in an escalation clause because not anyone, everyone is, and also whether the attorney is okay with an escalation clause. So go, you, you, have to go with the price. You, go can ahead. Cap, you can put a cap on the escalation clause as well. Yeah. Yes, yes. So right. this, is not, this is not done lightly. You know, anything with appraisals, anything right. with escalation clause, not done life, lightly. Same thing with ever waiving anything not done lightly, really want to have some very serious conversations about it. And that's where you may be going back to your broker to get advice. You may be coming back to one of your coaches to get advice. You may be going back to a seasoned agent in the office to get advice, but you don't want to go in with those conversations lightly, but they potentially have the ability to strengthen your offer. Um, and then of course us as buyer agents, I, we show our value when we provide guidance to present the strongest offer and when we put best foot forward so that we, we provide a complete offer when we're presenting it, not only for our buyers, but also for to the listing agent and for that seller. So next, on to next, Arlene. So I think this necessary documents to submit the offer is very similar to the same list that we read before. It's that New Jersey contract. So like this is basically what you're selling, sending to the other side. We want you to be specific, like all those other documents are necessary. This is what you're sending to the list side. Okay. It's the contract of sale. It's the lead paint. Again, if it was built before 1978, um, the seller's disclosure, which you normally can get under D for documents that the sellers have filled out, um, the pre-approval from the mortgage company, and it must be recent. Remember, we were just talking about that. The MLS fact sheet, which is usually just the, you know, the, the MLS with the brief tax this way, it's actually, it's best practice to include it. We do it because it, get, it shows the snapshot of when we saw the house, what was listed. And we know then that nothing can be changed on it. So if it says that there is central air and when we get further into it, it doesn't have central air, by submitting that tax rec, you know, that MLS sheet, it's proving what we saw written on that at the time. 
Well, also, when you look at those, um, sh the MLS sheets, you'll look at the area that says what's included and what is not included. Okay. Now, the tax record, you can always do that T for tax, and then that's a best practice to include it, but it's really optional. But become systematic again um, in everything that you're doing. So how long is the pre-approval good for now? The pre-approvals is good for as long as, you know, something is not changed. So whether an interest rate changes, whether, you know, anything can go in, but as a listing agent, I want to see a recent pre-approval, which would be less than 30 days. Okay, when I'm looking and my reviewing apples to apples, because I have to prepare and show the seller all of the options that came in. Kathy was talking about the terms earlier. It's not always about price, guys. It is about how um, efficient the offer is submitted. It's about the terms of the offer closing date, all of those things, all are, you know, the, how much the down payment is, what type of mortgage, whether it be a conventional mortgage, an FHA mortgage, a VA mortgage, all of those things a listing agent is explaining to a seller exactly what's going on. Um, all, you know, it's all cash at the closing table, understand that, okay? But true cash is true cash. So when you're submitting an offer, best practices here, you can call or text, like we said before, see if there's any offers on the table, gather as much information as you can, understand on the list side, you also have to not give out some information. So therefore, understand that. So don't be demanding of the information like, they can tell you how many offers are on the table. They can't tell you the price, okay? Unless their seller has agreed to tell it. But most of the time they don't. Um, some agents don't call you back. You know, try to just complete the offer as best as you can. Don't wait for the agent then forever and miss the time slot of getting the, getting the offer in. Um, some people call for highest and best, others do not. Find out if possible when the seller prefers to move and see if your client can accommodate that. When you look at the MLS and it says zero to 30 days or it says 120 days, don't always assume that it's from the date that you're starting at. It could be the date that it was listed or it could be the date that they accept an offer. That's why we try to encourage the listing side to tell us what the best date is to put down, whether you text that in text asking for it or call. Um, also, I want you guys to realize, look and see what your email is on the M on whatever MLS you're using. Okay, I really want to make sure that you have a good, valid email on that. I recommend that it be the same, the one that you use for DocuSign as the same as the one that you put on the MLS of how you can be copied, uh, contacted. Make sure you complete with your license number on that contract as well, and your office number. And the way you find that out is you look in the MLS and you click on your name and then it will come up and you'll see your contact card will show what company you're with and you also want to do the list side while you're at it. So on the listing that you're looking to purchase, you click on the top under the, you know, right over by the um, purchase price. There's little numbers there. You can press up there and it pops up a card. It gives them, gives you the agent's information on this side and gives you the office's information on the other side. I like to either take a screenshot of it or I like to have it and toggle back and forth. Um, we can always show you that later if time allows, but 
if you didn't like my little claw hands, that's what I meant. <laughs> All right. Any, I don't see any questions. Okay. Now, when you're completing the documents, I want you to think about go into the document state, uh, section. It's called details. You want to complete as much information as you can on the DocuSign and go into those details and put all the information in. After you create, you know, you have all that correct information in there, you're in the room, you're going to make sure that you pull up each individual document, <coughs> make sure it has all, it's completed, there's no blanks, or as, you know, every information that you can is filled in. You're going to create an envelope and you're going to be able to then send it for signatures to your buyer. Okay. If there's any information that's missing when you pull that up prior to sending it to the buyer is when you want to add it. You can't add it after you've already got it signed. Um, so really go over each document. And if you do have to add something, you have to send it to them again. They need to know what they've actually signed, okay? You wanna share it with the buyer and ask them to sign it and also initial it where it's needed. You can also, I like to do attach PDF. That was actually in dot loop. Do they have that in DocuSign? I don't remember. I don't know the answer to that question. That's really funny because I always use that Attach the PDF. Right. I did too. Um, I did too. Yeah. I think it's. Uh, I think DocuSign is simpler though, so it's easier for people to go in. It's a little more self-explanatory for signatures. Oh, good. Okay. You, so and they do. Um, they do allow um attached PDF after they're signed. Is that what it becomes know? a PDF? Yeah. Right. Yeah, you could you could upload your already uh, like web signatures, or you could just attach a PDF file to DocuSign. Yes, you can. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, in dot loop, there was something a little bit different, and that's what we were discussing. So you would send all the documents for signature, but also attach it as a PDF all the documents. This way, they can print them out and sign them if they needed to. Um, and then scan them back to us, but it's all good. So you, you're gonna see in a minute that this uh, needs to be updated. <laughs> so I will be updating this PowerPoint. I do apologize that I have outdated information. Um, this is a copy of a contract. There is a new contract that has been updated as of December 22nd, I believe. And it might have even, um, you know, you don't have to worry about it. The correct one is in doc, DocuSign now. So when I created this PowerPoint, it was prior to December. So a little bit of the differences. So I'm working for the buyer, not the seller. Um, I do, you know, the notice here. There's three times throughout the contract that the buyer will have to sign that is saying how agents work in the state of New Jersey. It's just how it's um, formatted. This page here, you wanna fill in the buyer's names. You wanna put where they currently live, okay? You wanna put in the owner's names. So you're gonna have to look that up through the tax records. You wanna look at, you know, it's the happy seller's names. You wanna put in the current address of where those sellers are living. And then this here is the property address of the house that you are trying to buy or the condo or whatever it is that you're trying to put your offer in on. Then you have here for the town where it's located, which county it's in, the lot and block number, which you can also find on that MLS sheet. Now, the thing that's missing here would be the um, thing for a condominium. OK, so any kind of condo, townhouse, there's another line here. So that has been updated on the new contract. I promise I will update the PowerPoint to reflect that next time. When you look at these signatures down here, 
these initials have to be signed on each page. It's basically the buyers are saying they've read through this page. Yes, they're signing it. Um, this one happens to be just uh, zoomed in for you. You can see where that's missing right here. One of the things that you know some people really like to triple check is the fact that these numbers are accurate. So what is the purchase price that they're offering? This is a million dollars. Is there initial deposit? You can do initial deposit. Um, whatever you do, have it signed, you know, have that check written out to the buyer's attorney. And then you get a copy of that buyer's, you know, you get a copy of that check and they have to submit it to their buyers. I honestly usually always leave this blank and have left it blank for years. In today's market, people are trying to put more meat on it, try to increase their terms. They think it works a little bit better. It's a strategy. I don't care for that strategy because this additional deposit here, I'm doing 10 days after attorney review or I move that up once under contract. So what happens is it's the same, you know, I'm just waiting for it to go under contract. And then I could say in three days after it gets out of attorney review or three days after it goes under contract. So when you look at the numbers, you got the total purchase here, you have a deposit amount here, here, and this, balance of the purchase price is also money. So it's funds. It's what kind of cash the buyers are bringing. And you have to ask your buyers what they're bringing. <clears throat> and that's where Kathy was talking before. We always say, how is it going to be divided up? So this 300,000 was put here. I can't really read it. Um, oh. This amount here is the mortgage amount. OK, this actually I don't know why this was changed, but I see the numbers don't totally add up, but it's a great example of in terms of like that's where you really have to double check not, yourself. Exactly. It's a perfect example of it not adding up. So when you do it, you're going to take that purchase price. Then you're going to subtract out the mortgage. You're subtracting out the deposit. And then you should be left with what's going to be on the purchase price. Or you do it as subtract, you know, add all the cash, subtract it from the purchase price, and that would give you the mortgage amount. Yes, Sanam. So initial deposit means like how much you are paying the down payment? The down payment, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, but you don't want to hold on to that check. Um, don't have it made out to your company because if you do, while it's being negotiated, that has to be deposited into the account. And that really adds to a little bit of a, you know, an issue. So what you really want to do is write it to the buyer's attorney. And then this, this deposit here, additional deposit. Normally in attorney review, it will be stated who's actually going to get that. And again, we have to, you know, do every initial each page. Now the next page here talks about the initial deposit. So you, that first line would be this additional deposit. The second line would be the additional deposit. And I don't know if you can see where I wrote um, 10 days after attorney review. Then you have here, it's going to the seller's attorney. Normally it's um, going to a seller's attorney because they want to be more comfortable with it. It's put in escrow. It's a non-interest bearing account, okay? Down here, this is talking about the buyer contingent upon getting a mortgage, okay? Here is the principal mortgage amount and then the type of loan that it's going to be. 
whether it's going to be a VA, an FHA, conventional. And this actually might be changed as well on the new contract. I think they do have another one. Um, you also have the term of the mortgage, 30 years, 15 year, whatever the mortgage company tells you these buyers are doing, that's what you do. Then you have when the mortgage commitment is going to be done, uh, submitted. Now, a lot of people, if you've talked to the mortgage company that your buyers are using and all documentation has been submitted and it is just to be determined which the house is, ask that mortgage rep, well, should we be, you know, can you get me a mortgage commitment within 30 days if they're trying to close in 45 or if they are going to be closing in 60 days? Do you think you could still get me a 30 day? Because what this mortgage commitment is doing is giving confidence to the seller. Because you got to remember, the seller needs to act and will be acting on good faith. But you want to make sure it's not a domino effect that this mortgage can happen. And then what happens is they're buying another house and that more and that house is now an issue. So we always, you know, like to get those mortgage commitments sooner than later. And it might just be subject to appraisal. But um, that's one of the things you can always look at. And that's a term as well. So I don't think we, do you guys know? Would you, sorry, I just had a question. So let's say if your buyer is pre-approved for, let's say a million dollars and they're going to be putting out 20%, would you follow up with their lender and verify those facts that are you 100% sure that the buyer can commit to that down payment and that it's a verified buyer, things like that? Absolutely. I okay. always verify everything with the lender. I do like to okay. become very good friends with my lenders and talk to them and know the status uh, throughout the entire process. And I Arlene, wanna make sure you. that if it's a million dollars that they're going for that house and they're saying they're putting down $500,000, I want proof of funds of that $500,000, mm -hmm. okay? For that, that large of a down payment. Who had a question? I'm sorry. Elizabeth. Yes, go ahead. Um, the mortgage commitment, the written mortgage, mortgage is that the HUD letter, like the HUD one? Or is that something different? Okay, I'm really sorry. What was the question? The HUD the, one? Yeah, the written mortgage commitment, is that the same as the HUD one? No. So the written mortgage commitment, is what a lender will give as a, okay, all documents and all requests have been satisfied. So therefore they have a commit mortgage commitment that these people can lend it. So you'll get a pre-approval right before they have a house in mind. Then once the house is identified, you get what's a mortgage commitment. At that mortgage commitment, it's knowing the taxes, it's knowing all the details of the house, okay? Sort of like underwriting? HOA fee, I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah. Underwriting. Yeah. It goes through underwriting. So it, you've got a pre-approval, you've done home inspection. Oh. So when you go under contract, that's when the mortgage company typically really starts the heavy lifting to get the additional financial documents and it goes through underwriting. You have an appraisal, the appraisal comes through okay. And um, based on all of the requirements being met, a mortgage commitment is saying, these people, the, 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 the loan company is backing this buyer to be able to get their mortgage so that you can get to closing. Got it. That's why it's so important to make sure that we communicate so that we can ensure that that date that we put down there, we can actually honor it and it could be satisfied by the lender. Correct. That's what I was saying. We want to put a date in there that we want to make sure the mortgage company can meet. Okay. And so like what's going on now to strength of offer is that documentation 
is all being submitted and going through a, I have a lender that does a preliminary underwriting for me. So it's gone through underwriting. So they know there's going to be no surprises. So I know that mortgage commitment should be issued sooner than later. Okay. Yeah. And if I could just add a couple of things to this, uh, that's why it's so important and it's best put forward as a professional when you're starting without with a buyer and they've given you that pre-approval letter, introduce yourself to that led lender, have a conversation with them to understand because you're both are working with the same client. Um, they are there and they can help every step of the way. The other thing is you're not doing the job of the mortgage, the lender, but checking in to make sure that everything, all the paperwork that needs to come from the buyers are, are getting to them on a timely basis because time is of the essence when it comes to things moving through, uh, through the system very smoothly. So these dates can be met. So your best foot forward by having that relationship and just offering, can I help in any way? Um, makes a big difference in terms of keeping things on track. Quite often things get delayed. The buyer didn't realize, buyer took a little bit longer to get their W-2s or to get their, you know, their paycheck stubs. Well, what happens is things go in a queue. So if you think about in and out boxes, if that buyer hasn't provided all that information on the dates that the lender needs, it goes to the side pile until that paperwork gets submitted in. Once that's submitted in, it doesn't go back to the pile where it was before. It goes wherever it was in line. So they may have lost precious days that now have a domino effect to get that mortgage commitment and even affect the closing date. So and don't be surprised too if the mortgage reps ask for documents multiple times because right. it goes into their system in the queue and they don't retrieve it correctly, whatever the case may be. Just assure that you're assure your buyers, because the buyers are going to get frustrated that yes, this does happen. You they are asked for more, you know, more than once you're asked for the same form. Do you guys both have questions, Elizabeth? Oh, sorry, I forgot to lower it. Okay. Um, I, I have a man. I have a question. Thank you. Yeah, um, so I'm just trying to say, like, if you're the realtor, right, representing your buyer, and your buyer is not, you know, the lender said so many paperwork. Are you supposed to stay on top and keep reminding them that listen, they've asked this for you once, they've asked this for you twice. If we need to honor that closing date, we need to get everything done what's holding you up? Like you need to have those conversations with your buyers if they're not proactive or? In my opinion, I let the mortgage rep do that, okay? But I monitor it with a friendly nudge and just say, okay. oh, by the way, did you get all the pay, you know, is your, um, is your mortgage rep looking for any additional paperwork? Oh, by the way, they might ask for things twice, but really try to get it in quick because of the fact we don't want any delays. I know how much you want it. So I do it in a way that's very friendly. I, okay. I, do, I do the same. I do the that same. Order. I feel like, you know, can I help in any way? You know, I just want you to understand. I know that, you know, they're looking for this information. I just want you, we want to keep everything on track so we can get you to your closing date. I say it all for their benefit. It's all about bringing value and them understanding that this is all for them, the way you okay. come across with it. And then so it's a very, you always want to be on their side, okay. right? Right. You always want to, because you may also discover they have an issue. Maybe you need to be able to go back to the lender and say, listen, we've run into a little hiccup. What can we do about this? Okay. And then in terms of communication, like does the, like when the lender is communicating about, I guess, funds or they're communicating with title company or lawyer, is everything supposed to be in one email thread for all the parties? Or do you have separate threads for different things? Like your communication with the, the lender, your communication with the lawyer, the your lender communication with should title. Definitely, you know, most of the time, the lender conversation is only between the lender and the buyers. Um, okay. I will have 
minimal joint conversations. But if I, you know, might send it to the buyer and also the lender and say, hey, just checking if we're on schedule, how's everything going? And I'm kind of asking the mortgage rep, but it's also reminding the buyers, hey, you have to take responsibility and do your job as well. Okay. And what goes on for the attorneys, it should be the buyer's attorney, the seller's attorney, the buyer's agent, and the listing agent on one thread. Okay. And you should also have a separate thread between you're the buyer's agent, mm -hmm. the buyer, and the buyer's attorney. Because okay. you don't want to tip your hand to the other side. You right. would love private conversations. And then, sorry, I have another question. Um, when you do like when the lender does an appraisal, are you as the buyer's agent supposed to send that appraisal report to this listing agent or if you do an inspection or, you know, whatever, radon testing or whatever, is that something you have to share with the listing agent or just share it with your lawyer and your buyer? Normally, the, the um, buyers themselves, since they're paying for those reports, they get them and they share them with the attorneys. Okay. I do not send anything to a listing side unless it is approved by the, the attorneys. I mean, by the buyer's attorney, mm -hmm. you know, I make, okay. I make sure that I'm not volunteering anything. Got it. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. I, I want to work with yeah. them and I will play nice in the sandbox, but I also, you know, Private personal information, I do not like to transfer. We're not allowed, we're not allowed to transfer a credit report or anything like that. So okay. and, and you remember that now, when you're you know you're under contract at that point. So you are there's a legal aspect of that is what whatever the communication should be done through the attorneys. There's time and place for us but there's a place where you wanna make sure that things are documented officially. And just to separate it out, I know, Nancy, you asked about kind of some of the home inspection reports compared to an appraisal. So like on an appraisal, typically we don't even get the actual paperwork of an appraisal. The buyer will actually tell, that's between the lender and the buyer. The buyer will tell us if the appraisal came in at, a good price, you know, at the good at the, the price that you paid or not. And if it didn't, if it came in lower, then that information is shared with the attorney so that conversations can start happening about how to negotiate, uh, how we're going to handle it because the appraisal came in less than what the buyer actually paid. And if uh, if the appraisal comes in higher or at list price, all I say to the listing agent is appraisal came in fine. And there's, I, don't, I think I've only had one person dare to ask me what that number was. And then I honestly will say, I'm sorry, I don't know that okay. number. They just told me it was fine. It's not my place to tell Got it. that information. The buyer owns it. I'll be honest, because a lot of times I don't even get the appraisal. It's just right. shared, like, you know, between the buyer and the buyer's uh, mortgage rep. And yeah. yeah not even shared with me a number. It's just, it's exactly. good. So. Exactly. Yes, I right. had that we're too. Here. You know. We're gonna move a little bit quicker guys. I don't, you know, I wanna really respect your time. It's seven after seven and poor Kathy wasn't supposed to be on tonight but is rescuing <laughs> me if my voice goes out. I have um, a quick question. I'm sorry, going back really quickly. In oh, terms go ahead, of the communication. Take in terms time. of the communication, it, and when it came to the um, pre-approval phase, I guess, I have a um, potential buyer, I guess, who is pretty much sending me all the documentation for the lender, and she's, she's opted to involve me in the conversation. Should I stay there, or should I politely say, listen, you know, you communicate with her directly? I, are you passing anything to the lender? Most, because many times she's sending me the documentation, I'm forwarding to the lender. No, no. She has, she has to forward it to the lender because God forbid you don't, you know, there's something mm -hmm. that's missing mm -hmm. and she will blame you. 
Plus, those are usually confidential private documentation, mm -hmm. and we definitely don't want any part of identity theft. Okay. So I do not get any of that type of information. Okay, she did that once, and I, what I did is I forwarded. I said, "Listen, I'm going to forward this over to Noel," and I forwarded to Noel and copied her on the email, and I said, "You know, from that point on, they've been in communication." So I guess that's fine. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, okay. I, I'm very uh, risk management uh, cautious. I know, don't want to have any information um, that could be compromised. So okay. thank you. Not a problem. And okay. Real Here's quick, real sorry. important. Oh, somebody else. Go ahead. Sorry. I just wanted to point out that you were correct. That um, there's an additional type of mortgage is section 203. Um, okay. Thank you. I knew there was another yeah. one there. <laughs> I know. I have to update this, guys. I'm sorry. There are quite a few little tweaks and differences. One of the other differences being that they now ask the buyer to pick their um, title company. Mm -hmm. So I will be putting Carnegie title on all of my documents. Um it's, you know, really up to the attorney which company they're going to be using, but I always make sure that I give my buyers the pre the um, preferred vendors mm -hmm. and Carnegie title happens to be one and so does the attorneys that I use. So we're going to go quick because of the fact of the time slot. So on here on the New Jersey MLS, you do have to see what's included, what's not included, make sure you write it out. As a standard, I like to write in, you know, what's included. I always put all appliances, unless the, my buyers doesn't want it. If it's really old and my client wants it removed, you know, we'll exclude it. Like if the washer and dryer don't look like they work or my client's buying a new one, we can exclude it. And then it's on the onus of the sellers to get rid of it. Um, all of that gets filled out. So this is all basic, you know, things. You guys can read through them. If anybody has any questions, please let us know. What I also like to do is when I do my buyer consultation, I make sure that I give and review a copy of the contract with my buyers. So therefore it's not new information when we find the house and they go into panic mode and don't want to sign anything until they have somebody review it. I make sure that all questions are asked up front. Um, right here, it also has to be updated. This has to say disclose dual agent. Okay. Any offer you're putting in has to say disclose dual agent. <coughs> I have been in the business 15 years or longer. And recently it was discovered by me that um, I was taught that it didn't matter only if it was uh, for somebody doing it, you know, if it was a KW to KW. But the actuality is that um, I don't have a clue if somebody else in the office is taking is putting an offer in on that same property. So being that the broker owns all the, the listings, I mean, all of the transactions that we do, it could be disclo dual disclosed because we don't know who else is putting an offer in. Anyway, this is what we talked about before how to get the license numbers, how to get the office license numbers. So it's the listing firm, it's the listing agent, their numbers, then it's the buyer agents and things like that. Are these new, new questions, guys, or are you good? New questions, just the dual agency. Like if let's say you're putting an offer on something that's a Remax agent. Correct. You still have to put dual, dual agency? You, like you will not say Excellent. buyers just? Yes, oh. you do. So anything that you're putting in, no matter what company it was, 
like I said to you, I've been in the business a long time and this only came up recently. Okay. Um, the thing of it is the brokers own the, you know, the inventory. So therefore, if you're putting an offer in and your coworker in your office, in your market center is also putting in an offer, you're dual disclosed because more than one person. This is how it was explained to me now. For 15, 14 years, I was always said that it was, if it was an outside of your mark, um, your, bro your individual broker, you weren't mm -hmm. dual agency. Like KW and KW never would be a dual disclose because of the fact that you have a broker in Ridgewood, there's a different broker in um, Rutherford, there's a different broker in Tenafly, so they were not dual disclosed, yet I was corrected on this. So thank you. Now. Okay. <laughs> right, Kev? Exactly. No, it's good information and important. I yep. was at um Tena Fly today and Judith had a class on this, and that's exactly what she said. She said, Yeah, you're you're you only have one client and you only putting an offer to that house, but how do you know that more of the people that work for me are not also putting in an offer for that house? So just to be safe, right. just do it. And guess what? I took that class, not today, but a couple of months ago. And that's how I was like, no, wait a minute. And she, she was really funny because she's the one who clarified that um, for me. And it was never taught to me that way. And I felt bad. And I said, to listen, I'm teaching everybody a different way about this. So that's why I'm very specific on making sure that I do it the way that I'm told now. Anyhow, some of the laws do change, guys. So we really have to always stay on top of it. And that's why I always try to stay and learn. Um, okay, so on the back here, um, <coughs> if you do have any additional contractual provisions, what I always like to write here is buyer has nothing to sell. If that is the fact, if the buyer has something to sell, you have to know, is it contingent on them selling that house or are they able to buy without selling? The only one that's going to tell me that is the mortgage person not the, the buyer themselves. I want to hear it from the mortgage person that they can get that mortgage without having to sell the house. Um, all of these are the different addendums as well. So don't know if I went the wrong way. Uh, this is what's included. We did this already. And understand communication is the key, guys. You always have to communicate and you always have to make sure that um, you're communicating with the other side, you're communicating with your client, you're communicating with um, the, the agent that's on it. So I always like to make sure the lines of communication are always open. Yet you do have a fiduciary responsibility to keep private information private, okay? And always remove your ego Get a win-win for both sides to be happy, okay? And I always say, let's play nice in the sandbox. Be advocates for your clients and always have your client's best interest at heart, okay? Now, I don't know which way this is going. This is driving me crazy here. Um, what I'd like to be able to do is look at it and realize that... Um, I'm blank, Kathy. <laughs> it's job. okay, early. Okay, so anyway, I always like to look at it and make sure that everything is done adequately, okay? Does anybody have any questions? Did I freeze? No, you're good. You're good. So funny because I can't get the recording to stop. No. 
Well, I mean, you can't because I'm controlling that. 